Hey, how are you? Fine, thank you, sir. How are you? Good to see you. I'm fine. I've lost you for a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wait a minute. I'm just gonna. Okay. Wait a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm here. I'm with you. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. That's all. Uh, my subject is the uh, 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring or Arab yeah. Uprising. So I watched your, some of your debates and fr at Frontline Club and uh, at BBC yeah. and you once said, you, you said that several times that nobody saw it, it coming. So uh, can you explain, can you expand on that a little bit? Let me just make this quiet here. It's going to keep peeping. Wait a minute. Ah, uh, this problem. I can't uh, do that. Um, do you speak to me? Oh, no, it's gone. Right. Yes, I, 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 I hear you very well. Do you hear okay, me? Good, 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 good. Um, yeah, to, right, I'll answer that question now. Um, If you look back 10 years, everybody was very surprised by what happened. No one expected the level of protest that there was, the way that people in not just Tunisia, but also Egypt, then Bahrain, then Libya and Syria, of course, and other places overcame, I suppose you'd call the barrier of fear about an authoritarian government. Uh, and it all started, of course, 17th of December with Mohamed Bouazizi, a very poor vegetable uh, trader, salesman, uh, with a small cart, um, having his, uh, his produce taken away from him and his, not just his produce. I went to that city and I spoke to the people who took it away from him. It wasn't just the produce, they took his scales where they weighed it. And for, um, a poor guy selling vegetables, that was the last straw, and he, he set fire to himself. And the protest demonstrations escalated really quickly. Partly that was because the Tunisian trade unions who are well organized got involved in the whole thing. But as well as that, it struck a chord. People were really ready for something different. But nevertheless, uh, after Tunisia, it came Egypt and then Syria, Yemen, Bahrain, and uh, 10 years on, we are, uh, the region is uh, in a pretty bad shape. Uh, Syria is in ruins, uh, Yemen is catastrophe, Egypt has a uh, general in power, um, Libya is bitterly divided. Is there a bright spot in this? No, not really. Um, the only country which has, has started on a process of political transformation is Tunisia. And while that is proceeding, um, and it's not easy, but they've done a lot better than any other country in the region, uh, they also have huge economic problems, massive unemployment, and they were the biggest net exporter of jihadist fighters into Islamic State and some of the other extremist groups. Uh, so this, this is a country still with a lot of problems. Unfortunately, what happened was that it, they were failed revolutions. Uh, the the counter-revolutionary forces were strong. Uh, to start with, in Tunisia, uh, President Ben Ali crumbled quickly. Uh, he was up against uh, strong institutions within the country. Uh, the military, the trade unions, and the crucial act in Tunisia was that the military did not turn on the, on the protesters. They didn't turn their guns on the protesters. And once that didn't happen, Ben, ben Ali, who was corrupt and anyway discredited, just basically raced to the airport, got on a plane and went to Saudi Arabia. And as far as I know, that's where he still is. It was more complicated in other countries. Yes, Mubarak in, in Egypt fell quickly, uh, relatively quickly after nearly a month of demonstrations. But that also became um, a failed revolution because to start with, there was political failure amongst the, the so-called self-styled, self-regarding revolutionaries from Tahrir Square. 
they did not organize themselves. They argued between each other. They split into two parties. You know, one party would split into two parties. Then each party would split again. And, and then they come back together and they spend more time discussing structures than how they, what they were going to do with the country. And also, because it was um, an uprising almost without a leader, it wasn't like there was one big charismatic man or woman at the top of it who could, who could be a rallying point. And they were up against two very highly organized forces. One, the Muslim Brotherhood, and two, the Egyptian armed forces. So in the end, it became a, a confrontation between those two forces. So 10 years on, the Muslim Brotherhood leadership is in jail or dead. The military triumphed. And really, they gave up Mubarak to preserve their own power. They, they were happy to see Mubarak go because he was one of them. He had been a general in the Air Force. Uh, but what they wanted, because they don't just have the military power, they also, they run large amounts of the economy. They're, it's inconceivable that they give it up their power voluntarily. Um, so, uh, yeah, Muslim Brotherhood in jail or dead, and uh, the, the leaders of Tucker Square uh, are either in jail or in exile or dead. And Egypt is in the hands of a dictator who is worse than Mubarak ever was. Uh, crucially, he has outside support. He has support, particularly from the Gulf, from Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And he has support from the United States and from Israel. Taken together, that's really quite formidable. And why are they supporting him? From the Western point of view, because he, he was stay, he, 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 CC equals stability. And one of the major problems with the Western approach to the Middle East, I'd say, is that in the West, leaders tend to look for somebody they can, they need an address, they like one person who they can talk to. And in Egypt, that was Sisi, and before that it was Mubarak, and in between, when there, were, there, was, there was President Morsi of the Muslim Brotherhood, but it was more chaotic, and Morsi didn't really want to talk to Washington very much. Then, the United States particularly just got very confused. Is this some kind of failure for the Western world as well? All of um, this, Syria, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, all, all, this, all the region. Yeah, w w once it became clear that um, authoritarian rulers, notably President Bashar al-Assad, were going to fight back, they weren't just going to crumble. And we all really sort of assumed they'd go. Uh, but it became clear he was... He, the structure of the country, the way that his, the rule of his family is set up means it's built to withstand a coup. And he, that was a great success of his father, who came up with that system. Um, there was a massive diplomatic failure internationally. The, the Security Council at the UN became split very quickly between, basically between friends of Assad and enemies of Assad. So that is... Uh, Russia and China versus the Western permanent three. Uh, so that meant that as a forum for diplomatic activity that was pretty much neutered at that point. Um, there was talk of military intervention, but after Iraq, they didn't really want to do it. There was a crucial moment, I think, uh, in 2013, after the chemical attacks on Eastern Huta in Damascus, uh, after that, Obama, you might recall, said that there were going to be there was a red line: do not cross it, or or Assad, you're in you're in for it. And he did cross it, and Obama essentially blinked, let him get away with it. And after that, the Syrians were really super confident. I was in Damascus at that time, and they were really worried, the regime, really worried about what was going to happen. And when it didn't happen, they could not believe their luck. <clears throat> Let's speak a little bit about Europe. Europe is heavily influenced by the Arab, uh, Arab uh, uh, uprising because of the way of refugees from Syria, from Libya, and uh, subsequently uh, populism in Europe, uh, we can see mm -hmm. 
for example, Hungary, Italy, France, and many other states are afraid yes. now. And uh, there is exact point uh, when the European Union made a mistake. Okay, we, we, we talked about uh, President Obama and the red lines regarding chemical weapons, but what about Europe? Well, Europe is, finds it quite hard to act as a coherent block when it comes to foreign policy anyway. Uh, all the different countries, particularly the ones that, the stronger ones, militarily especially, in those days, Britain, it was before Brexit, uh, the French, Germans potentially, uh, they, there is a limit on how far they want to get involved in things. Britain uh, voted against, in the parliament here in London, they voted against getting involved in, that, in an American strike on the Assad regime in 2013. Uh, they too were worried about the, the Iraq hangover um, and there was a feeling that not a great deal could be achieved. So there was a lot of, you know, wringing of hands. Oh my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And there was a protracted diplomatic effort to try to organize the, um, the Syrian opposition politically, which really in the end came to nothing. Uh, so faced with a fragmented opposition, uh, powerful outsiders who, particularly at key moments, were not prepared to act. That meant that Assad, uh, suddenly the tide, the tide turned. And once the Russians intervened in 2015, then he wasn't going to lose the war after that. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, all that energy from the Arab population Arab countries, whatever that means, there is no single mindset in the Arab world, of course, but do you think that all that energy is lost now? No, potentially not. I think that the, um, the intimidation from authoritarian rulers is real and people are scared of that. Plus, I think among the, the generation of 10 years ago, there is, I think, the leadership of many of them have left. There's, and there's sort of a sense of cynicism and defeat, I think. But there's a younger generation coming up and all the factors which resulted in those uprisings, and I would say the principal one is demographic insofar as there's a very young population, 60% under the age of 30, that is still the case. It is still the case that those young people and a new generation coming up suffer widespread unemployment, um, anger against the system, against corruption, against authoritarianism. But of course, they're nervous about looking, you know, about putting up their hands and getting involved in a protest. But for me, for, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if they can't have economic progress to get people jobs so they think less about change and politics, and so they're, they're happier with their lives. And that isn't happening, they're not getting that. Then inevitably, at some point, there will be more uprisings. In, Syria, in, in Egypt, there is a massive pressure of, of population, economic pressure, and I mean, that's one reason I think, well, where, why CC keeps such a, a tight grip on it. And also, if you look, I was looking recently at the um, huge pictures of huge demonstrations in 2013 by the Muslim Brotherhood. All the guys in those demonstrations have not changed their minds about Islam and political Islam, but they've been slammed down on so hard, and many hundreds and thousands in jail, they are stepping back from it. But those views have not changed and I'm, they will be back. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot that can happen.